Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is obviously a little weird this afternoon. I guess that word is all right to use at a funeral. But uh, we are in lockdown because of the coronavirus today, and yet today we uh, would be amiss royally if we didn't pause and remember our good friend Holloway Martin today. We've got family here. We've got a few friends. We've got our funeral staff. And... Uh, we also, by way of uh, technology, have uh, Barry's family from the great state of Louisiana. We hope all of you are safe and well. We're also filming this uh, for a delayed broadcast. You can pick this up tomorrow. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling y'all, y'all are here. But uh, those of you that I'd like to tell are not here and can't hear what I'm saying until tomorrow. But anyway, we thank our crew for filming it today. It'll be on YouTube. Uh, tomorrow on a delayed broadcast. Uh, I'm honored to be here as, as Holloway's pastor, Holloway Louise's pastor, but uh, I guess we all would say that we didn't expect to be here quite this quick. Uh, Holloway, of course, was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer uh, just a matter of weeks ago, and uh, in fact, the last time I had prayer with him and, and saw him because of the virus, was then, and uh, he had uh, great strength on his face, he had a lot of courage in his eyes, uh, but he was determined that he wasn't going to take a lot of treatment or do anything to try to prolong his life, and I count it as a, a gracious act of God that he did not suffer any more than he did, and uh, that is okay, that is okay, he's with the Lord, and today we rejoice in that. We're going to have fun today, we're going to remember him. We're going to let the family uh, share a little bit uh, today about him. Uh, but let me begin by uh, reading the obituary, if you will. You have a copy of it in your program. It's on the back. You may want to follow along if you're a, uh, a visual learner there. But let me read, read it for us today. Uh, Holloway J. Martin, Jr., 87 of Mahia, passed away peacefully at his home early Thursday morning, April the 2nd of this year, 2020. He was born... April the 24th, 1932, in Calvert to Holloway and Flois Bowler Martin. Is that somebody's? Yeah. We don't know what that is, do we? They're uh, probably trying to get that's okay. Okay, we're all, we won't pay any attention to it. Right. Holloway grew up in Limestone County, graduated from Grosbeck High School. Texas A&M University was his next stop on his educational journey, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree. In 1953, he joined the U.S. Air Force, where he served as a navigator until 1957. Returning home, he continued his education at Baylor University School of Law, where he received his law degree. Back to his Limestone County home, he served as the county district attorney, and during this period of time, he married his best friend, Louise Carr, in 1964. Holloway went into private practice in 1970 and retired in 2017 after a long, successful career. A true Southern gentleman with a disarming, affable, and congenial personality, Holloway was a true asset to the area. There's so many things that endeared him to the people he came in contact with. A colorful storyteller, a wonderful sense of humor, a great family man, a fine Christian and churchman, lover of his land and cattle, highly esteemed legal professional who enjoyed Louise working by his side for many years. Holloway was a member of the First Baptist Church of Mahia, the Mahia Lions Club, the Grosbeck Masonic Lodge number 354, as well as being a Shriner and a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason. He was preceded in death by his parents and his son, John Douglas Martin, in 2012. Holloway is survived by his wife of 56 years, Louise, daughter Ellen Martin Ford, and husband Barry of Capel, and their 13-year-old twins, Emma and Jake Ford, as well as brother-in-law Robert Carr III of Deming, New Mexico. The family will have a private family graveside when this service is over. Memorials may be made to the First Baptist Church, 500 East Carthage in Mahia, or the Community Health Care of Texas Providence Hospice on Commerce Street here in Mahia. It's also an opportunity for you to get online at Blair Stubbs and leave the family a message of condolence if, if you were not able to, obviously weren't able to be here today. We encourage you to do that. They'd appreciate that. My memories of Holloway are, are vivid. Uh, I don't ever remember him not having a smile on his face, I don't think. 
And uh, don't know whether that, <laughs> that was always earned or, or deserved, but he just had that kind of a, a demeanor about him. And I will always remember that. Uh, got to pray with him uh, when I saw him last. And he had a strong grip and um, felt like we had a connection. And he had a connection there that uh, will never be taken away. A connection to God that was, that was special. Uh, we'll remember him as, a, as a, a churchman. He was in church every Sunday. He uh, was a part of uh, the Fisherman Sunday School class for years and years and years. And uh, was always uh, willing to do whatever we asked him to do. I wanted to read just briefly from three different passages right now. And then here in a minute I'll focus on his favorite passage, the 23rd Psalm. But I thought it would be proper for us to talk about uh, the Christian faith for just a moment. You know, Jesus came and died so that we could live. And that's that's what it's all about. Uh, he took our place on the cross and took care of the penalty for sin that all of us deserve. And Holloway, as a young boy, apparently made that call to follow Jesus and uh, let him be his Savior. John 14, this is Jesus. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He was speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to us. I know you trust in God, so trust also in me, for in my Father's house are many man mansions. I still read the old King James, that way I like that. It says many rooms in the NIV. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I'll come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. For you know the way to the place where I am going. Over in 1 Corinthians, Paul takes an entire chapter to talk about the resurrection. We're fixing to celebrate Easter next Sunday and the, 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 come, the coming alive of a dead man who walked out of the tomb. And, and of course, we're talking about Jesus and that validated everything God said about himself. Everything that God promised in Christ was validated when Jesus got up and walked. And uh, it promised for us, it says, he was the first fruit of many to follow. So you and I are going to walk that same walk even though we physically die. We don't spiritually die in Christ. And one day we'll get a new body just like Jesus had. And we'll walk around just like Jesus walked around. Paul wrote these words and I like them. He said, we will not all sleep or die, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. It's talking about getting a new body. It's talking about getting a new tent to live in eternally. When we think of Jesus appearing to over 500 witnesses after his resurrection, he had a, a body that they recognized. They knew it was Jesus. Next time we see Holly Martin, we're going to recognize him, but he may be in a 30-year-old body. I don't know. I'm looking forward to that. I bet he is too. But it says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death doesn't get the final call on this deal. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Turn to one last passage, and it speaks of a reunion. It speaks of a day when, when Christ does come back. And it says that he'll bring with him those who have, who have gone on before, that have died before us. Now, that's going to include a lot of really neat people that some you've seen, some you've known well. But think about that for just a minute. And here's what he said to the people at Thessalonica. Brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who die or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Well, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have died in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have died in him. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds, Meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. I love that word we. That means every believer. Every person that's ever put their trust in Christ is going to be at that reunion. That'll include Holloway Martin. And that's something exciting to think about. Let's pray for just a moment. God, we come to you today seeking comfort. 
this family is torn today because this is not a normal funeral that we're used to having. This is not quite what we wanted to have for Holloway because we love him so dearly. But today, Lord, in this special moment, you will meet our needs. And we praise you for that. And I especially lift up Louise and Ellen and Barry and the kids today. I just ask, Lord, that you give them that special sense of this is a good day. This is okay. This is the way it was meant to be. And God, we know that you will embellish it just how you want it to be. And Holloway will be remembered exactly the way that we want to remember it. Lord, thank you for his life. Thank you for his witness. Thank you for his example to his family. Thankful, thank you for his faithfulness to you and to Louise and to the cause of Christ. And Lord, may you just take care of him right now. We ask in Jesus' name. When I look at the moon and stars in the sky, I can see the hand of the Father in the valley so deep and river so wide. I can see the hand of the Father. I can see the hand when I look around me. I can hear the voice blowing in the wind. I can feel the mighty touch of the Father's love. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, His presence surrounds me. I can see the hand, I can hear the voice, I can feel the touch of God. In the music of birds and rustle of leaves, I can hear the voice of the Father in the thundering rain and whispering See him tapping his foot, maybe even singing a little bit. Now. Right now, we're going to have some folks come up and share from their hearts. These are family members, and uh, each of them has something special to share with us. Ellen, are you going first? All right, come on. Crazy times, and um, like Marcus said, 
Uh, we wanted to honor my dad in a way that um, would be special, and because of the situation and what's going on in the world, we weren't able to do it quite the way we wanted to do it. So um, we're doing it the way that we, we can. To a daughter, um, there are fathers, there are dads, and then there are daddies. And there's just something a little different implied when you say the word daddy. If you have one, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and I have a daddy. And uh, we always had a special bond that. Um, I, I don't know if I could get away with a little bit more than that, but I, I think I probably did. Um, but, you know, there's so many hallway stories I could share. We'd be here all afternoon. But um, there's a few that kind of stuck out to me, and um, it just makes me smile every time I think about them. But, you know, when I was a little girl, um, every night my dad would come in, to my bed and uh, my mom and they would say our prayers with us and then after the prayer were over um, he would sing rock a baby to me and um, he would hold me in his arms and then at the end when it said and down look on baby cradle and all he would throw me up in the air and he'd always catch me and that was like I like the prayer, but that was my favorite thing. And he always would catch me, and that was every single night when they would come to our room, and they would say our prayers, and he would do that. That was my favorite part. And um, he had big, strong arms, and I never worried if he would drop me, um, because he was always there, and I was safe in his arms, just like he's safe in the arms of Jesus today. And, you know, he always calmed my fears, he uh, put a smile on my face, and he not only calmed the fears of me, Doug, my mom, and our community, um, you know, just through his personality, through his business, but um, if you know him, well, you know that he had a very charming and humorous personality. Um, you know, we have so many stories that, um, just made me laugh, but this one, this one ranks really high, and that's a time when I was in sixth grade in junior high, a little younger than my kids are right now, and I was at the old Mahia junior high, and around the back where the, the old band hall was, and that parking lot by the band hall was that white rock gravel, and you know, Occasionally, my parents would get busy at the office, and um, about time to pick up your kids from school, they might have maybe one day run, run a little bit late. And uh, one day, I remember sitting on my instrument case behind the band hall with my hands on my knees and just pouting because I thought, my parents forgot me. They left me at school. and. You know, nobody else was there, and I just remember being so sad. And then here I hear this like screeching of tires, and I look up and I see my dad driving our cream colored station wagon with the wood paneling. And he made a big loop all the way around the parking lot and peeled out in that white gravel and it was just a cloud of dust and instantly I went from having a major pity party to just a big smile on my face and I forgot all my worries and then he slams on the brakes and locks up the wheels of the station wagon and I had totally forgotten all my fear all my worries um, all my sadness because he put a smile on my face and I think he did that for definitely everybody that's here and definitely everybody um, who ever came to see him at the office at the house um, he just had that that way to make your your cares go away and make your fears go away 
and um, he had a, just a calming presence that, you know, I remember what whatever was going on in my life as a young girl, an adolescent, even an adult, um, anything that was going on, he could find a solution for it. And, you know, no matter if it's tragic, you're going through a trial, he was always there to let you know, don't, don't worry about it. it. We are going to get through this. And it just brought that calming nature. And um, I feel like he was always the definition of biblical wise counsel for definitely his family, his church, and his community. And, um, you know, we, there's not a lot of that today sometimes when you want to, you have some problems and you have some things that you want to talk over with someone. Um, there, there's just not a lot of people like that anymore. And I, we just cherish the time that we had with him. Uh, and I know, you know, things are crazy in the world today with the pandemic. And um, like I said earlier, this is not the way that we wanted to make him feel honored. But, um, you know, the fact that we can't hug people and mourn with our friends and our family, um, it makes it even harder. But I think if he was here today, um, I know exactly what he would say. He would say, well, we have to play with the hand that was dealt to us. And uh, and that's so true. I mean, whatever the situation was, I know that he would he would make it okay. He always made it okay. And um, I'm just blessed and honored to be his daughter and be mom's daughter. And um, I just thank you guys for coming. And thank you guys for attending and um, that's all good. Amen. 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 I, uh, I wanted to just share a few words. and There's a saying that says, Of the life of a great man, much cannot be shared that the excellence of his life has not already said. George Washington Carver said, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, patient with the old, sympathetic with the striving, tolerant with the weak and the strong, because someday in life you will have been all of these. And then finally it's also said, you can easily judge the character of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. I think if nothing else could be said about Holloway Martin is that every single person who knew him, every single person who interacted with him would have to say that he always treated everyone with kindness, with fairness, with integrity. The first night I met Holloway, I was working at the church that I was currently serving at the time as the sports pastor. I had already met Ellen and we were dating. And that first night that I had the experience of meeting Holloway, he came up to the sports desk where I was serving and he came up and he said, Hey there, said, uh, I'd like to sign up for soccer. And of course, not realizing that necessarily someone of his age might be ready to play soccer, I said, Well, uh, are you ready to sign up yourself or someone else? He goes, No, I'm ready to sign myself up. I said, oh, okay, all right, well, let's do that. And then he laughs and chuckles and says, Barry, I'm Ellen Stad Holloway. It's great to meet you. And I can remember he disarmed that moment just by being him. And from that very first moment that I met him, uh, he was always kind and gentle and fair. You know, Holloway was always also known, as Ellen said, for his wise sincere and often hilarious words. He's known for that. Proverbs 18.4 says, Words of wisdom are a stream that flows from a deep fountain. And I think everybody in this room, as Ellen said, probably has a dozen Holloway stories. Louise will say that any time they went to dinner party, everybody wanted to sit by Holloway because of the stories. And he would tell stories and stories. And I, I, I cannot count the ways that we would sit around 
uh, every holiday dinner when we would visit with them, and the number of Holloway stories. Uh, even if you've heard that story many times before, every single time he told it, it was sincere, it was funny, and he never missed a punchline. He got them all. You know, he's also known for the way that he loves his children. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. I really kind of got to know Ellen for the very first time on a beach in Florida while she and I were standing as lifeguards at a youth uh, retreat. And it was that day that I knew that I could probably marry her because the way that she talked about her daddy, the way that she talked about her family, was the way that I knew I wanted my future wife to think about her family. The way that I wanted my future wife to, to, to revere and to love her daddy. And I can remember that day, it was her uh, sharing of Holloway which made such an incredible impression on me. And then finally, he was known for the way that he loved his wife. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. On Sunday, September the 8th, Louise had been staying with us as we were preparing. Ellen was already on a trip in Hawaii, and I was preparing to meet her the next morning. And as I came home that September evening, we usually would find Louise who was staying with us while I was away and Ellen was away. She would take care of the kids for us and normally we would see Louise and that night when I walked in, I didn't see Louise. And I walked around the house and still didn't see Louise. And so a moment later I said to Jake, hey, find Lulu. And so when he finally found Lulu, we found her um, on the bed in the bedroom where she stayed and she was injured. She had fallen down our stairs and uh, was pretty in pretty severe pain at that moment. And she says, oh, I, I think I've, I've hurt myself. I think I've messed up. I said, Louise, no, no. And, and she was insistent that I was going to go on that trip. I said, Louise, I'm not going on that trip. And she says, I think I should call Holloway. And as a marriage pastor, to hear authentic stories about someone's treatment of their wife is one thing, but to get to literally experience it, because the thing that stood out to me at that moment, Holloway and Louise had literally just talked 30 minutes before, and I can remember when she picked up that phone and she called him, and she said, Holloway, he goes, hello, Louise, just like you just talked to her. And I know familiarity often puts us in that place, well, hello, you know, you just answer the phone, um, almost too common. But he was excited to talk to Louise. And when she told him, oh, Holloway, I think I messed up. And, oh, no, oh, what's wrong, Lou? And he asked her, and, and she unfolded the story, oh, no, honey, I'm coming right now. She's like, no, no, you don't need to come. I'm coming right now. I'm coming. And he immediately hopped up and said, I'm going to be there. And as you know, for the next week, he never left her side. And of all the stories that I can tell about men and how they treat their wives over and over and over again, the stories of how he treated Louise. He truly loved her as Christ loved the church. He would have died for her. And in his final moments, his biggest worry was that he was a burden on Louise and on Ellen and on the family. I was so thankful that really God gave us these last two and a half weeks as a precious gift. In his final days, he and I uh, would sit and talk occasionally, and a lot of times we were watching Fox News, but when we would have a moment of pause, one day I, I said, can I, can I share something with you? Because the night that we had really at the Beans house there in Waco, uh, determined that the next morning we were maybe going to have to go and plan his funeral. We laid in the bed there at Charles' house and we gathered around and we prayed for Ellen. And selfishly we wanted, you know, we prayed for Louise. We, we selfishly wanted 
to keep Holloway with us. And we say, God, if this is your will, you'll give us this miracle that he'll survive after he's taken off that ventilator tomorrow. But if it's not, give us the peace to be prepared for that. Well, as you know the rest of the story, that next day was a miracle. He, he woke up and it came back to his vibrant self. And for the next two and a half weeks, we had the opportunity to sit and visit with him and care for him. One of the things that I did one morning during my devotional time was just pray for him. And it was so funny that that day, my devotional was from the book of Lamentations. And I want to read this to you because uh, I shared this scripture with him on one of the days that we sat. It's uh, Lamentations 3. And starting in verse 22, and it says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in Him. To the one who seeks Him, is good to wait patiently for the salvation of the Lord. And then, Verse number 31 says, For men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. The last thing that I got to say to Holloway is he was laying in his bed and, and he was uncomfortable and taking an afternoon nap. And as Ella and I went in there to uh, sit with him for a minute, myself and the kids were about to leave and it turned out to be for the very last time prayed with him, lifted him up before the Lord. The last word they got to say to him was, Holloway, we love you. We'll be back. We will see him again. And we are excited to be able to see him again And when we are all back together. I can't wait for the first joke that he tells us. But he introduces us also to Jesus. He say, thank you guys for being here. This is special for us today. I told the kids yesterday that any of them that wanted to share Feel free to write something down if they didn't feel like they should give it up. And Miss Emma wrote this, and I'm going to read this for her. My Grandpa Holloway Martin was the best grandpa I could ever ask for. One of my favorite memories I have is going to the farm, seeing the cows, and going to the barn. I was so happy every time I could come over to visit. I know he is with God in heaven today, and I want him to know I love to the moon. And back. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That was good. Jake, have you got something you want to share? Hallway um, <laughs> always had the best sense of humor and always was able to like light up the mood. And um, one of my favorite memories was always like getting to spend time with him and like with them on the farm and in the shop, like hunting and fixing stuff and um, I loved that um, that he always like cared for others before himself, you know. And I'm glad that he is in heaven now, and that that I was suffering, and, and that he knows that we're gonna take care of him. Good job.
Sometimes people can be Christians and not be good men. <laughs> they, they, they struggle with, with their Christianity. Uh, but he did not. Uh, I knew him as an Aggie. Sometimes you can be an Aggie and struggle with being uh, a good man. You know, uh, Sometimes they are, you aren't very good if you're an Aggie. But, uh, but he was a good Aggie. And he was a good Christian. He was a good man. He was a good Aggie. And he was a good attorney. He was a good friend. He was somebody that this community looked up to, uh, and, and he's one of those guys that I think they would have called, I can think of two or three guys in my, in my world today that I won't name their names, but they have professional aptitude, and if I needed to know something about their profession, I could call them, and they would immediately give me the answer if they knew it. But then they're also somebody that, if, that I would pick up the phone and think of first as somebody to call if I was in trouble or if I didn't know the answer to a problem or if I just needed, as Ellen said, some wisdom on the topic. And I, and I count Holloway as one of those guys. And we didn't have a lot of great, huge discussions at church. Uh, our, our discussions usually uh, consisted of talking about cows or uh, the latest cover crop that he had planted or uh, something that he'd seen on his game camera that was very, very important, and I just knocked that off. I hope that's not bad. Um, or we would talk about John Deere tractors, or we would get a few things in about the eggs. And uh, all of it was fun, all of it was down to earth, all of it was respected. Holloway was one of those guys, and uh, I know uh, Elmer's here today, but it seemed like there's a generation there of men who, who grew up on the farm, they grew up around farming because that was life. That was not just an avocation. It wasn't just a hobby. It was uh, it was life and death. It was uh, starvation or, or, or survival. But deep within their blood, they just enjoyed the land. And it was not a surprise to me that, that Holloway loved the 23rd Psalm. I remember as a kid learning the 23rd Psalm, and I thought it was a nice thing. And the whole idea of talking of David, a shepherd, talking about his relationship with sheep being like his relationship with God. And that, that kind of rang true to me, even though I didn't know a lot, a lot about sheep. 
Uh, we're not normally sheep herders in this area. But animals are animals, and livestock is livestock. But the relationship that David had with his God, he illustrated through his avocation of being a shepherd. I can't help but believe that Holloway loved to go to the farm because he met God out there a lot. He saw God in the ground. He saw God in the water. He saw God in the, in the cattle. Uh, he saw create in creation the very essence of God in our lives. But it was a quiet place, wasn't it? It was a, it was a comfortable place. It was a place where you could uh, lay aside the things of this world. You could be out there and it got real quiet and it got real solid, I mean, solitude like, and uh, it was a place where you could be by yourself. Let's look at this psalm for just a second. We've read it a hundred times. We've memorized it. We've uh, looked over it. I know uh, for me, it means more today than it ever has. When I was 10, my family and I went on a trip to Colorado. I remember we were just driving down a dirt road up in the mountains. Came around a corner and there was a small meadow. And out in the meadow, there was maybe 50 head of sheep. And I immediately, my eyes went to the left because there was what looked like a covered wagon an old western covered wagon on rubber tires. It was weird looking. But you could tell it was somebody's house. Uh, sitting beside it was a guy on a, on, a, on a stool, and beside him was a Winchester lever action rifle, and beside him was his dog. And I realized that I had run upon a shepherd and some sheep. I had just memorized this psalm in the, in grade in Sunday school at church, and uh, I mean, it like it came alive. I'm like going, okay, there's a there's a shepherd. Now I understand all this stuff. For me, that was a great moment in my growing in my relationship with God. But I know in recent days I've turned back to this psalm, and the psalm reminds me that in Christ, because of God, I have all I need. I have every need in my life taken care of. Let's look at it. He says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want, for he makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sheep need food, and they need water. And they like green grass, and they like it belly high. And that's, that's what this describes here. And we serve a God who knows that we need a lot of things. And he is amply providing those in every way possible. I think Holloway understood that. But it also says here that he leads them beside quiet waters. You know a sheep will not eat out of a rustling stream that's making white water over rocks. It has to be a pool where the water gets still. There's something very tra tranquil about that, but there's also something very powerful about that because that's where they filled their bellies up with water. That's where they got what they needed in the way of a drink. You know, God gives us those quiet moments when He fills us up and He takes care of our spiritual needs as well. God is the one who keeps us in the way, walking where we need to be walking. Um, those sheep were notorious for going the wrong way, for going left, for going right, and, and not knowing exactly where to be. And the shepherd had the responsibility of keeping them on track. And that's exactly what... God is. God is a provider. He is somebody who always provides exactly what we need. I think we have heard evidence in some of the testimony here today that Holloway had learned how to give guidance to other people. Maybe because he had learned how to receive guidance from his God. I love that. He goes on to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Shepherd had two, in those days, instruments that he protected his sheep with. One was a, a long rod, uh, just a straight staff, maybe even made out of metal. And that is what he fought off the lions and the tigers and the bears with. The wild animals that came to devour the sheep, he would literally kill them and protect the sheep from that. He also had a shepherd's crook, which had a cook on it, usually made out of wood. We usually think of a shepherd with a shepherd's crook. But all the time it was used to reach out and grab that crazy sheep by the neck and pull him back in. Before he went over the cliff, before he fell off the rock, before he just did something else that he didn't know he was doing. 
Does God do that? Does God protect us from our enemy? The greatest enemy of all, the devil. Yes, He protects us from temptation. He keeps us walking in the way. He protects us from people in our world who are ruled by evil and who are out to hurt us. But He also guides our paths to the way of keeping us from making silly mistakes ourselves. And I love that. I love that God cares enough about my every step of my every day that I can invest that same way in someone else. You've heard of Holloway being a great dad, a great grandpa, uh, a great husband. Maybe it's because maybe he knew how to protect his own. Maybe he knew how to love his own, to live with his own in such a way that he was there to watch over them because of how God treated him. In verse 5, he takes a turn and he says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Those are words that speak of a banquet room and a great party that was called in someone's honor. And the person who is honored is seating at the head table, maybe even at the right hand of the, spe of the speaker's podium, which was the honored place. And the whole idea of anointing someone's head with oil was something that was used to anoint a king to, uh, to declare him to be the head, the chief. My cup overflows speak of abundance and somebody being treated as an honored guest by always meeting their every need. This is how God treats us. This is how God overwhelms us. We think of God's uh, provision. We think of His protection. But here we see His promotion, if you will. He promotes us. He gives us a sense of worth. He gives us a sense of uh, you are okay because I made you. You are okay because I love you. You are okay because I saved you. You are special to me. I'm throwing a party in your honor your entire life. We loved Holloway because he made us laugh. I wonder if Holloway was willing to make us laugh because God had made him laugh. Maybe God had honored him in such a way that he said, you know, people have a hard enough time. I'm going to make their life a little easier when they're around me. I don't know if he was hard as a DA. I don't know if he was ever hard as an attorney. I'm sure there were times, as Ellen said, when uh, she and Doug got the worst of Holloway. But I bet most of the time he was generous and gracious and kind and was able to take humor <laughs> and twist a bad situation into something better. God is able to do that with us. And finally in this last verse, he says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I always get excited when I see that word forever in Scripture because it means exactly what it says. This relationship that God has entered into with us his Holy Spirit convicting us, us saying yes to the Lord Jesus, and then coming into fellowship with God. God didn't give that to us for a day or a month or a year, but forever. And it speaks of eternal life. It speaks of a place where death will never happen ever again. The last chapter of Revelation it says it is a place where there will be no more tears, no more death, no more dying, no more funerals. It doesn't actually say that, but that's kind of what it means. Because there will be a place where eternal life exists. And notice here he says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. God's with us on this earth. Thank God He's with us. Thank God He walks and talks and carries us through this life. There's coming a day when we die, when we don't have to cry, we don't have to worry, we don't have to be upset about it because we enter the forever stage of our life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today we stand applauding the life on earth of a man who thought more of the next life than this life. And I like that. Holloway knew where he was headed. I knew when I shook his hand and prayed with him in the hospital before he came home the other day that his decision to not take treatments uh, 
was something he thought about a long time and something he dealt with for quite some time. When he found out how sick he was, as much as he loves this life, as much as he loves his family, he knew he had a good destination planned. And he knew where he was headed, and he knew it was okay. When you have somebody who has faith like that, confidence like that, it breeds it into us. And I'm thankful to have known the man because I believe he was a man of faith. If you're here today or watching this video and you don't know for sure that if you died today that you'd go to heaven, God wants you to know. It's real easy to know. There's a man named Jesus, the Bible says, was the Son of God, and He came and laid down His life, died on the cross for us, giving His life freely to pay the penalty for sin. And He offered that to every human being that's ever lived on this earth. He offered that to every one of you today. If you don't know for sure that you would go to heaven today when you die, put your life, put your hand, put your trust in the hand of Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you. He died for you because He loves you. And all you have to do is reach out and say, I trust you, I believe you did that for me, Jesus, and I want it in my heart. Invite Him in, and you can know what Holloway does. You can know what this family knows. All of us who know Jesus, that is the most important thing in our life. We may not always show it the way we should. We may not always focus on everything that God wants us to focus on. But at the end of the day, we know who holds the keys of our heart. And holds the keys of eternity. And so we trust in Him. Why don't you trust Him today yourself as well? Let's bow our heads together as we close this service. Today. Lord, I do thank You for my friend Holloway. I thank You for his... His influence in my life. And I thank you how he influenced this family, this wife, this daughter, son-in-law, these grandkids, these friends who are here today. He made such a difference. He didn't have to, but he chose to. And that makes it even more special. God, we would love to have had him here on this earth for more time, but we would never, ever Take him from you. So Lord, we're thankful that he is now pleasant and he is present in your presence. Lord, we thank you for the, the, the awesomeness of paradise. As Jesus told that man on the cross beside him today, you'll be with me in paradise. There is a beautiful place where we go when we die. And Lord, we're thankful that today when we think of that, we think of Holloway. Lord, until we get to see him again, until it's our time to join him, Lord, watch over him. And in the meantime, watch over this family and guide them and protect them. And I pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes our service today, and we're thankful to those of you who were able to tune in or, or be with us today. And the family will now make their way to Falkenberry and for the final interment of the body. Thank you very much.